Hello and welcome to the Moore Institute for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College and our second of two winter 2022 brown bag lectures uh, presented in collaboration with the University of Manitoba Peace and Conflict Studies graduate programs. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that uh, the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. My name is Jason Brennan, and I'm a manager here at the Moore Institute, and uh, Dr. Charlotte Enns, our director, sends her regrets she's not able to be here today and asked me to step in for her today. The Moore Institute was founded as the Morrow Center some 20 years ago through the vision and support of Dr. Arthur Morrow and under the direction of founding directors Dr. Sean Byrne and Je Dr. Jessica Senegi. Throughout the pandemic, the Moore Institute has continued to shine the spotlight on the alumni of the Man University of Manitoba's PhD program in Peace and Conflict Studies, and today we do that again in welcoming U of M PAX alumnus uh, Dr. Kauser Ahmed. Please note that today's lecture is being recorded and will be available on the Moore Institute's YouTube channel in the coming days. A link to the lecture will also be added to the Moore Institute's Brown Bag Lecture page. The format of today's lecture will include a post-lecture question and answer session. To facilitate this, we ask you to type your question in the Q&A box at any time during the lecture, and we'll entertain those questions during the question and answer portion. Uh, we'll also, uh, if, you, if you just want to indicate you have a question, right, we're, we're also happy in a smaller environment like ours to, uh, to bring, bring voice to your question and allow you to, 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 to ask the question directly. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn on your microphone. So uh, we, uh, I will now uh, introduce and welcome Dr. Kyle Zarmer back to the Brown Bag lecture table. And he'll turn on his camera there. And I'll just uh, a brief introduction to Kauser, if I might, for a second. Uh, Dr. Kauser Ahmed is an educator and researcher in peace and conflict studies who has in-depth understanding of social conflict and its peaceful transformation. While serving in the UN peacekeeping operations and conflict zones, he earned experience in peacebuilding, mediation, and transformative dialogue in resolving intergroup conflict. Uh, Dr. Ahmed serves as the executive director of the Conflict and Res Resilience Research Institute Canada, or CRIC for short. It's a little easier, but it's an important Thing. Uh, the Moore Institute is honored to partner with Crick and with the Rotary World Peace Partners in hosting Professor Mohamed Yunus for a discussion in 2020. That discussion was recorded and can be viewed on the Moore Institute and Crick YouTube channels. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, welcome back to the Brown Bag Lecture Table. Thank you very much. It's a privilege, uh, Jason, and very happy to be with you this afternoon. Terrific, and it's always good to see you, uh, if not in person, on online. And uh, just before you, you enter, uh, educate us through through your lecture on, on the topic of today's uh, lecture um just just you know you graduated in 2017 you founded crick what were you thinking what was it what does it now become what what has what crick evolved into tell us a little bit that story thank you jason uh, uh and i i think it's, it's a very important question for our audience today <clears throat> and many of uh, our audience uh, students i totally understand um so i I, I graduated in 2017, uh, and uh, at this point in time, I used to uh, kind of meet uh, our uh, faculty member, Dr. Jessica Senehi, uh, quite a bit informally, uh, discussing about the future, what uh, we should, I should pursue, uh, things like that. And and this is why today I would like to acknowledge Dr. Jessica Senehi's, uh, I would say, a recommendation that uh, I might uh, at that time she's she said that we are going to explore uh, the idea of uh, founding an NGO, and I, that kind of stuck with me uh, for two reasons. First is uh, as we all understand uh, our our navigation through uh, seeking jobs in academia because PhD uh, is meant for that, but it's it's not always very easy, and especially in Canadian context uh, uh, and and getting into an academia. Uh, might seem to be challenging at some point in time. So I would go back uh, and thank Dr. Jessica Senehi today uh, because she actually uh, triggered the idea that I should uh, or I might explore uh, founding an NGO. So in uh, December 2017, with one of my colleagues here, Dr. Hilal Mahiuddin, we uh, founded this organization uh, and it is almost five years now. And uh, we, uh, as Jason asked me, okay, what it has become. So the center as, 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 as like hundreds of think tanks in North America, it started slowly and we started taking off projects. Our signature project is Rohingya Crisis Research. 
and we have published book and uh, second book is in press now. And uh, this is just the research part, but we are also uh, very actively involved in activism and we are working uh, to educate Rohingya refugee uh, children in the camps in Bangladesh. And we have finished one project funded by MCIC and we have just received funding from Rotary Global Grant and we are going to roll this project. And our third project is going to be remote learning. And we are going to run a pilot first because a portion of Rohingyas are being uh, relocated to an island. And if that is successful, we are going to uh, uh, seek funding from Global FS Canada. So on, on that activism side, and uh, also we are continuing research on violence and extremism prevention. And uh, I am very happy to share with you the audience today that uh, I have received funding from Community Resilience Fund Public Safety Canada. Uh, it's a $400,000 uh, project for next three years. And uh, I'm working with the University of Winnipeg where, <clears throat> sorry, uh, where I teach now as an adjunct professor uh, in this project. Uh, I have a team of educators and we just uh, started our first uh, phase of the project. Uh, so it is also part of Creek because I lead Creek and, and to add the final thing up, uh, about Creek is that you will also be happy to note that Creek is now uh, is an affiliated center with Global College at the University of Winnipeg. So it just happened uh, last month, a month, uh, two months now. So I mean, you'll find us uh, with Global College working together in, in a number of projects in the future. And on a final note, uh, we, we run a Transformative Dialogue. It's a webinar series. Uh, and uh, today we, we have uh, just uh, touched 75 episodes so far. So it's a huge you know, volume of information and data if anybody wants to uh, know about global conflict issues and conflict transformation. Thank you, Jason. Fantastic. And uh, you know, Global College are, are great friends of ours and frequent collaborators. And so that's, I'm very happy about that. Um, you know, the combination of uh, a, U, a UN peacekeeper uh, PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies and your entrepreneurial spirit in making all of that come together is uh, very impressive and we're proud of your accomplishments. Uh, we'll also look forward to hearing more about uh, some of the projects you're working on in, in, in with assisting with the Rohingya. Um, but let's uh, let's turn our attention to today's topic and I, I will fade into the background here and let you let you take over. Thank you, uh, Jason. I'm going to share my screen quickly because I have a PowerPoint. Good, I hope uh, the PowerPoint is up. Great, um, so uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the audience, uh, I have come with the presentation today and, and the talk uh, the way you um, consider it uh, quite informally. And I've titled it Canadian Freedom Convoy, what it is and what it, it isn't. Um, and I, in the beginning, uh, let me also uh, share with you that uh, these are my personal research, my personal opinion, uh, which will be reflected throughout the presentation today. And if you have any questions, concerns, please uh, send me an email. I'll be more than happy to respond. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, this topic or this subject is a little sensitive for various reasons. Uh, in the past, I spoke we, in national media uh, on, on 4th of February with CTV, and since then I have received a number of emails. So let me acknowledge that it is a sensitive, uh, part, partly sensitive uh, matter that we are going to discuss today. And there might be some slides uh, that you might find a little difficult. So I would uh, acknowledge and uh, appreciate uh, if you kindly uh, view it in the spirit of academic discussion. So uh, having that uh, small uh, disclaimer in the beginning, let me uh, you know, go ahead with the uh, presentation. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So, Today's presentation, uh, what I thought of sharing with you is, is flashed on the screen. I'll start with the timeline, uh, then I will talk about freedom convoy, the leadership, influences and tactical commanders on the ground, logistics of the freedom convoy, the signs and symbols that uh, we have seen throughout the whole protest in various places in Canada. And I will briefly also speak about social movement uh, and whether it is a movement or it's just a 
simple anarchy. And finally, I'll talk about nonviolent conflict resolution based on my small piece that I wrote in the conversation uh, three weeks ago. So um, just uh, also to share with you that uh, the following sources were consulted in preparing the presentation. Uh, Winnipeg Alternate Media is a, a Facebook uh, you know, alternate media channel that I follow uh, just, uh, followed just to track the events in the protest. Uh, I did social media analysis using NVivo 12s, uh, mostly Twitter feeds only. Uh, then also I consulted Anti-Hate Education Network in Canada. They have uh, a large web based knowledge repository. And of course, uh, Southern Poverty Law uh, Center, Anti-Defamation League, and coupled with uh, some of my students' field observations. As you see the timeline of Freedom Convoy, I just uh, picked up major uh, events, uh, which started from January 14th, when there was a GoFundMe fundraiser even, uh, event took place. And actually, uh, that is where we have started seeing the movement uh, gaining ground. Then uh, January 15th, uh, actually the day when the tracker mandate was uh, the, you know, uh, initiated, commissioned by federal government, uh, and uh, then the protest gained more momentum. Because as you see, uh, we have, uh, I've just picked up the word exactly, the protesters said at that period in time that the government crossed a line. Uh, then, of course, uh, January 23rd, January 24th and 5th, uh, this convoy physically started rolling out from uh, British Columbia, then Regina, and of course, uh, uh, Ontario and Manitoba. Um, on January 27th, we have seen uh, quite a large uh, sum of money has been raised uh, by GoFundMe page, which started back in January 14th. And at, on that day, uh, the GoFundMe page uh, released $1 million. And of course, uh, the, the convoy was rolling down uh, through Canadian cities. That is very important uh, because uh, GoFundMe page later on, as you see in this slide, <clears throat> stopped uh, you know, disbursing money. But that was the last they did, uh, releasing $1 million. Uh, then 28 and 9, Ottawa Parliament sees actually physically started and January 30th, we have seen uh, the Coote Alberta, uh, the crossing point between Canada uh, or Alberta and US, uh, the blockade uh, started uh, popping up. Uh, January 31st onward, the rally started. Je February 2nd to 4th, we have seen GoFundMe uh, stop distribution of fund. The second blockade we have seen coming up at Milk River, Alberta, and of course we uh, see protests started gaining ground in Manitoba, Winnipeg as well. Uh, and then uh, on February 7th, the Ambassador Bridge blockade started. Emerson uh, border crossing uh, st uh, you know, uh, blockade started on February 10th. And uh, very, very disturbingly on February 15th, RCMP seized a large cache of weapon from Kurtz Alberta protesters. And on February 21st, uh, the Emergency Act was enacted from federal government uh, to uh, remove the protesters. And uh, within the next three days, the protesters were removed uh, uh, from Ottawa and various places of uh, Canada. So that is the brief uh, timeline from January 14th and actually February 25th up to up to that mark that march so it is just over a month that whole freedom convoy uh, uh, that rolled out in in canada in this slide as you see i will be uh, introducing the leadership um, so as you see the names james border and he is the founder of canada unity and very briefly i'll show you uh, what canada unity wants to do they have a fully functional website as of last night and also he's uh, one of the organizers called United We Roll. And it is a precursor to the Freedom Convoy rally. It, it happened last year, but it didn't get much attention as Freedom Convoy did. Then we have Tamara Leach. Uh, she claims to be a Métis heritage and uh, was initially a member of the Wild Rose Party in Alberta before moving to Manitoba and joining the Maverick Party. Then she moved to Ottawa, of course. Then we have BJ Teacher, a truck diver and podcaster who described himself as a vice president of the Ottawa Convoy. He ran uh, for office in 2015, lost as a conservative MP uh, from the Toronto Danforth constituency. 
uh, at a, a People's Party of Canada event in 2019, he made a speech in which he suggested Canada is suffering from the stench of political Islam and stated that some of the leading candidates for the Conservative Party of Canada had ties to Islamic extremism. And finally, we have uh, Chris Berber, truck driver from Saskatchewan. Berber calls COVID-19 vaccine mandates tyranny at its finest. In general, I just uh, picked these four personalities because they were very visible in, in terms of their appearance in national media. So if we summarize, we see that uh, all of them actually belong to either uh, white nationalist groups, anti-environmentalists, and anti-labor movement groups. Then let me also introduce the influencers. So here is a very interesting uh, part of the whole Freedom Convoy movement. So typically what we see is that uh, leadership on the ground or in the media uh, leading from the front and all these things. But in this particular uh, matter of Freedom Convoy, we have seen there are a number of influences. So there are many, I just picked four major ones because uh, we have a lot of data uh, about them. So Brian Peckford, uh, who happened to be pre uh, former premier of Newfoundland Labrador, and he's the chairman of the group called Talking, uh, taking back our freedoms. And of course, uh, and the uh, COVID-19 mandates, that is his uh, main agenda. And he's also, uh, uh, he also asked Canadians to reject forced COVID-19 injection or vaccination for the children. Then we have Roger Hodgkinson, a pathologist from Alberta, and he's also a member of Taking Back Our Freedom Movement. And he actually uh, came out uh, and wrote in the page, what we call Rumble, uh, for uh, a blog, and he said that uh, COVID-19 uh, is killing people, and it is per uh, perpetrating an, uh, a, 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 a hoax. Uh, he said that it is a hoax ever perpetrated on an unsuspecting public. Then we have Randy Hillier, uh, is an independent MPP in Ontario who was removed from province's Progressive Conservative Party in 2019. Paul Alexander is a board advisor of Taking Back Our Freedom Group and is a former science advisor to the then US President Donald Trump. And that is really interesting. So the last group that I, I'm going to introduce uh, are Tom Quiggin. Uh, he describes himself as a protective intelligence for the Ottawa convoy. And he actually, uh, uh, he released intelligence reports on Google Doc for protesters. He once worked at the security intelligence exp expert for the Canadian Center for Intelligence Security Studies and published a uh, uh, story in the Canadian press in 2016, claimed that, uh, claiming that he uh, extremist teachings at mosques and schools are dangerous for Canada. Daniel Bulford, a corporal of RCMP, is an advisor also from Taking Back Our Freedom Group, and is, a, uh, is associated uh, with, uh, I, I mean, he's an R RCMP officer anyways, and associated with the Mounties from Freedom Group. Uh, and being a convoy spokesperson, he alleged on Facebook that guns could be planned, uh, and he was suspecting that uh, it will be a setup to undermine the freedom convoy movement. Then we have Pat King, is a far right protester who has said that uh, in the videos posted in social media that uh, there might be future plans to target politicians' homes, and that I quote here: "The only way that is going to be solved is with bullets." Unquote. He has called the arrest of Prime Minister Trudeau uh, and auto of police, uh, the then now retired or resigned Peter Stoli, Scully. And finally, we have Brian Dennison, a former Calgary police officer who resigned on December 18th after declining to get a mandated COVID-19 vaccine. In his biography on the Taking Back Our Freedom website, where he's listed as an advisor, he said, I quote here, was suspended and charged with discreditable conduct and insubordination and it was uh, posted by Calgary Police. So on the ground, we see a lot of uh, members in this uh, convoy movement actually have law enforcement and military background. As I promised earlier, Canada Unity is the core group which actually started organizing the Freedom Convoy. You can visit their website. I checked last night and here it is. And uh, from the outset, you will find a very benign uh, website uh, and asking people to just get together. But actually, uh, it says, uh, if you see uh, the main vision of Canada Unity uh, is to uh, you know, gather people together in a bond of unity and greatest creator. 
uh, and, and they, it believes uh, the, despite all the differences that we have allowed to define us, Canada shares common struggles and triumphs. And this is uh, actually uh, run by James and Sandra Border, one of the uh, lead, uh, you know, leaders or one of the you know, lead components of Canada Freedom Convoy. They, uh, the Canada uh, Freedom Convoy actually came out with a very formal memorandum of understanding and they called it call to action, even when uh, in the early uh, weeks of January. And I just uh, uh, presenting two screenshots here just to show you what, what actually is a couple of pages long. Uh, you don't have to read. So just have a look here that uh, the way it addressed Can Canadians and concerned citizens, permanent residents, indigenous communities, employers, employees, and uh, this is what uh, they wanted to highlight that uh, the key point is the current spike in discrimination and segregation issues impacting millions of Canadians, uh, those who are impacted by vaccine. And if you go further down the road, you will find this memorandum of understanding uh, you know, devised by Canada Unity Group is, is, is very much uh, provocative. Uh, if you see uh, the bold words here, uh, that uh, the Senate of Canada comprised of the present 105 honorable senators located in Ottawa, Canada, represented by Honorable George F. Furry, uh, Speaker of the Senate, and not, not limited to the present sworn in sitting honorable senators uh, and the House. And the Governor General of Canada, Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Mary Simon, representing the Queen in Canada. And this is what they wanted to do. And I'll, 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 I'll talk a little later uh, about their intention when I speak about their objectives. So here are these two interesting parts that uh, Canada Freedom Convoy is, uh, uh, is involving the senators and the governor general in order to topple Canadian uh, you know, elected uh, government parties uh, in, in the uh, parliament. And I, I'll, I'll tell you a little later and expand on it. So just at this point in time, have a look uh, what they have actually written in the MOU. Now let's talk about how much money was raised. Um, so I'm not going into all those details of uh, analysis because I have downloaded uh, a leaked document uh, from uh, DOD Secrets. And this is in a spreadsheet, a uh, very large spreadsheet. And I've analyzed data about uh, the donors, the locations, the uh, number of amounts, and the organizations that uh, donated in this fund. So uh, very, uh, summary uh, wise, as you see on the screen, total raised $18.1 million through uh, two uh, uh, online funding uh, groups, uh, sites called GoFundMe and Gives and Go. So Gives and Go is a Christian uh, uh, movement supported uh, by the group, those who run this uh, online donation platform. As you also see uh, in a very summarized way that most donors uh, actually from the USA, however, most money in terms of amount came from Canadians. Uh, residents in wealthy enclaves across the United States, for example, Beverly Hills, California, to suburbs of Austin to Florida, beach communities sent in fact millions. Uh, if, you, if you boil down to actually Ottawa protest and Ottawa group, uh, what we see around $540,000 was raised uh, to support the anti-vaccine mandates and more than 7,400 donors contributed an average of about $72.29 uh, totaling uh, to the 540,000. So it is just a, a snapshot of, of the funds that were raised for this one. And as I said earlier, uh, GoFundMe only released 1 million uh, so far raised from their platform. Uh, again, a brief snapshot when we analyzed, and I have quoted it uh, from uh, somebody else's analysis, it is not mine, just a disclaimer here. Uh, so this analysis shows that, uh, uh, as I said, $18.1 million was raised, but uh, 92,000 people, those who donated, uh, we have received the data uh, because of this, uh, you know, uh, gives and go, uh, you know, leak of this website. Uh, when we analyzed uh, that, uh, who else? I mean, in the history of uh, fundraising and donation, 
uh, over the past you know seven eight years so the researcher who who did this research uh, he came out with the ranking of uh, last 10 15 years and he shows that the canada freedom convoy actually is the number one a group which raised so much of money yeah, within the past, you know, as I say, 10, 15 years. And in the right side of the screen, you can see the names of other groups like Kyle Rittenhouse Rittenhouse Legal Defense, then support of COVID-19, Facebook Whistleblower, uh, and Pfizer Whistleblower, Melissa Kim. So out of these five large uh, fundraising event, Freedom Convoy is the highest uh, that they raised money. One of the lead scholars of our country, uh, Amarnath Amar Singham, uh, who teaches in Queens, uh, he shared a tweet and which I captured here, as you see on the screen, the distribution of the funding. Uh, as, you, as you also notice that uh, most of the numbers, I mean, in terms of numbers uh, came from United States, then in terms of Money Canada, and a bit also came from UK, and that is quite surprising. And also you see the uh, detailed background in the left of the chart uh, when I'm mentioning the countries. So as you see, Australia, Denmark, Netherlands, Ireland, France. So money came from all over the globe, actually. From that uh, particular uh, uh, you know, uh, leak of the uh, Gives and Go project, we also have uh, been able to uh, see where from those money came. And here is a snapshot of another researcher uh, who, share, who shared uh, his data uh, through tweet, and I captured it. And you can also find, and we can also see now the location of the donors uh, who gave funds to the Gives and Go platform. So now uh, I will switch to signs and symbols. So there is no doubt that uh, in our country, we have freedom of expression freedom of association and freedom of assembly uh, enshrined in 1982 constitutional act and which is also popularly known as charter of rights and freedoms so there is no no problem in assembling uh, in a place and lawfully uh, protest and this is our democratic right but what is troublesome and which i spoke in details on 4th of february ctv uh, interview that we started seeing right from the beginning uh, in this movement, there are lots of signs and symbols used by extreme right groups, white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups. And this is why uh, I got interested myself that what is the problem in this uh, whole freedom convoy that people are using extensively these signs and symbols. Here is a summary again, uh, we have seen anti-Semitic and the indigenous symbols signs referencing Jesus and Christianity along with Bible verses. We have seen Canadian and American flag side by side, also Irish flag and Italian flag. And this is uh, another uh, uh, very interesting phenomenon in this whole uh, convoy protest movement that in all the places throughout the Canada, we have seen very prominently Canada and USA flag uh, together. And in Winnipeg particularly, uh, we have seen uh, American citizens uh, coming with sol um, in solidarity with the with with our Canadian protesters, we also saw Q and on symbols and phrases as you see on the screen were written and uh, you know staked in the snow and curse, and also money masters Rothschild scabble fiat currency financing all genocides plus COVID mandates. This whole phrase was written in in some of the places. And of course, people have used uh, "Make America Great Again" hats, and they they gestured with the white power uh, gesture, as you see, as some of you might know. And particularly in Winnipeg, uh, uh, at one point in time, we have seen Saint Michael's cross, and it is very innovative because the cross uh, is used within a circle, uh, denoting uh, you know global implication of of this one. And some of you might know that St. Michael's Cross is used by militant Romanian fascists in 1920s, and which has been adopted in recent years, uh, and, uh, you know, to blend with traditional Christianity with racist, Islamophobic, and anti-Semitic beliefs. So um, these are the summary of the signs and symbols, and I'm going to show you some, not all, I have curated many, so uh, Dave Steinberg, one of the leaders, you know, self-proclaimed leaders, he, in his TikTok video, used soldiers of Odin very clearly, and also shared his ideas about uh, these uh, white supremacist and extreme right 
uh, matters. And a couple of slides from Instagram, uh, a compilation of flags that has been uh, located. And one by one uh, with definition, uh, if, you, uh, if you're interested, uh, I will post, post the whole slides in my website. You can download it as well. So uh, starting from Canadian flag, uh, which, is, uh, which belongs to 1892 to 1965, and which was practically used uh, to symbolize a time when Canada was only white man's community. So that was very prevalent in most of the uh, demonstrations. Then we have uh, this uh, whole, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's called actually the accelerationist movement. And I will briefly talk about it at the last part of my presentation today. But accelerationist groups are also very common in the extreme right groups, and they have very different way of uh, you know viewing change in society. Also, we have seen uh, very similar to MAGA MAGA like Canada First, and it is also a white nationalist organ uh, movement organized by Tyler Russell, as you see his uh, photo in the right uh, bottom. Uh, and also very interestingly, Romana Didulo, uh, and uh, she declared herself as the queen of Canada. And uh, she has gained uh, quite a bit of followers and it says 70,000 plus. And uh, she's also a key on a conspiracy theorist. She actually, if you visit her site, uh, she actually declared war uh, against all the governments, especially the federal government. Then you have uh, Don't Tread on Me. Uh, it's called Gunston Flag. Uh, it's, it's, it has a history in the US, but uh, this is also we have seen in some of the uh, you know, uh, movements in on Ottawa, in Alberta. And it, it actually warns that do not uh, come and mess with us. We are dangerous, as you see the uh, snake symbol in the flag. Then we also have. Uh, Quebec nationalist move, movement patriotic flag as its own. Then we have uh, this Farfada group. Farfada comes out of a small group from uh, Quebec, it's called La Motte. And they are also very prominent and, uh, and, and visible in the whole protest movement. A uh, thin blue line over uh, black maple leaf is a symbol to support police officers against the Black Lives Matter movement. So we have seen a lot of these kind of flags and symbols as well. And if you go and think more about symbolism, then I will also uh, you know, share with you that the word Hong Kong actually uh, is a neo-Nazi uh, symbolism uh, used in the past. And, uh, and if you want to know more, you can read Dan Collins report, a very well-written one. And the title is, as you see on the screen, and it is actually uh, connected with neo-Nazi movements in, in many places. Um, also, uh, no joke, white nationalists and clowns, uh, and we have seen a, a huge number of them actually. And uh, they're also connected with some of the neo-Nazi groups and uh, the Daily Stormer and increasingly popular white nationalist podcast, Goy Talk also use those memes in their posts. And uh, many of these, uh, you know, uh, anonymous troll accounts have also changed their profile pictures and used clowns instead. And uh, they also use this word honkler, honkler sen. So these are the signs and symbols that uh, were extensively used. All are connected to extreme right, neo-Nazi and white supremacist movement. Uh, before I move into the objectives of the freedom, uh, focusing narrowly, about, about the original objectives and what they have achieved at the end. Uh, let me also tell you that uh, in some of these speeches, uh, the organizers actually uh, cited uh, the Canadian forces you know, landing in uh, an op and a war in Vimy Ridge because uh, they wanted to you know, provoke the, their followers that it's a war and what Canada did in Vimy Ridge and won, uh, they have to also win the battle. So these are very disturbing uh, speeches. Uh, I didn't intentionally bring it here. So, but these are also available uh, in the in the web if you might be interested. So let's focus on the objectives. Um, actually, we have some insights about uh, Freedom Convoy's original uh, objectives, and we have uh, three leaked documents, and we have a couple of leaked documents, and we have three plans, as shared uh, uh, by Chris uh, Ra, if I pronounce it correctly. 
And, uh, and in 2022, they had uh, mentioned three plans, as you see, plan A, B, and C. So uh, what we see is that uh, in plan A, they initially thought of 500 trucks and will be complete uh, will be completely uh, blocking uh, Ottawa. Then plan B, they had uh, the idea that they will keep the trucks somewhere else outside and they can they will shuttle people back into the parliament area because they thought uh, they'll be blocked uh, the roads and thoroughfares. And plan C uh, is very clear that break the law if there is any resistance. Um, nonetheless, the people also varied in their beliefs and attitudes. Uh, as one of my students, uh, uh, he, he, he kind of interviewed some of them. And also what we see from the uh, thousands of uh, you know, interviews shared in the social media, uh, there is a huge range of uh, people, uh, those who were there, uh, opposing mandate uh, to uh, you know, Donald Trump's mask and uh, make America great again hats. So we don't see any coherent objectives, although in the front, we, we know that it is anti-vaccine, anti-mandate uh, mask, uh, mandate protest. But when we, we spoke with a number of them, we don't see any coherent objectives felt or shared by all of them. Uh, of course, uh, that is why I see it is uh, that um, protest against vaccine is actually uh, secondary. The prime reason was to topple democratically elected government, i.e. Uh, the liberal government uh, in the federal level, which is very uh, similar to Michigan situation, as some of you might know, and also January 6 uh, to 2021 uh, Capitol Hill insurrection. And now comes to my point where I relate that if you uh, remember, uh, recall the MOU that I showed, <clears throat> this whole movement uh, actually proposed Governor General and Senate of Canada to form a new government with protested themselves. So that is their core objective, which they actually reiterated in the later part of their movement, uh, early to uh, mid-February. So that is why I keep asking. Uh, so the, the whole convoy was titled freedom. So is it freedom from fear or freedom from want, if, he, if I use the uh, human security lens here? So, uh, there are a number of uh, you know, uh, articles written and uh, exposé written by experts uh, law in, in the legal side in Canada. And some of the snippets I have posted here is that freedom in Canada is not absolute. And uh, the, if you are talking about vaccinated and uh, is not being vaccinated and endangers the freedom of others, then it is a question. Rights or liberties is an understanding of the careful balancing of Canadian constitutional law. The Supreme Court of Canada has clearly and repeatedly ruled that the freedom we enjoy in a democratic society are not absolute. Charter rights from religious freedom to speech and uh, other assembly is subjected to section one and which says and guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society." Unquote. And in a famous case of Supreme Court of Canada uh, versus Oaks, uh, it states that in each case, courts will be required to balance the interest of society with those of indig individuals and groups. And that is why I, I keep asking whether uh, the freedom which has been sought so desperately by the protester is absolute. And we also see the prevalence of mis and disinformation extensively throughout the uh, freedom protest. Uh, and on the last day when uh, Ottawa police and others stepped in to dislodge the protesters from parliament area, the whole Twitter was buzzing with the news that these police are from United Nations. And there was a photo posted alongside uh, with the police that they come from outside and they are UN forces. A photo was uh, uh, of a UN airplane, white and uh, written UN. And when we dig deeper, uh, dug deeper, then we found it that uh, this airplane actually was doing maintenance in one of the hangars in Canada because that is what they do uh, each year to maintain. So we have seen a, a huge number of conspiracy theories especially on this, uh, uh, in those three days where the protesters were being dislodged. 
And as I see that uh, these are organized by transnational far-right network and funded mostly by well-to-do conservatives, uh, both in uh, America and Canada. As I said, uh, I will talk about a uh, little bit accelerationist uh, because I do see echo of some of their ideologies. And that is, this is why I'm putting up a question whether it is a social movement or just an anarchy, whether we should be careful in the future or not. So um, if you read the accelerationist ideas and their approach to social change, which definitely differs from alt-right and neo-Nazi groups in the sense that this group believes in expediting social change through violence. Where, whereas the alt-right groups and uh, similar groups uh, like them, they believe uh, that they should form political groups and slowly uh, gain momentum and their footings in the political spectrum of the country and then change the society. So uh, excellencies don't believe in the alt-right technique because they, they think that it takes too much time and it should not be uh, allowed. And so that uh, they suggest that it should be uh, expedited. British philosopher Nick Land's idea, who once upon a time taught in Warwick University in 1990s, uh, and whose many of the writings we have found in alt-right blogs, he says that uh, the, the, you know, uh, the connections between his idea and uh, with some of the libertarian Silicon Valley billionaire Peter Thiel and Trump's iconoclastic strategist, uh, what we call you know, Steve Bannon, and, and they all share similar ideas. And it is basically a political response to capitalism. And uh, what they say is, and they profess is to disrupt, critique, or dethrone, and to accelerate and exacerbate uprooting, alienating, decoding, uh, abstractive uh, issues. And it also presents a genealogy of uh, accelerationism if you're interested, and particularly uh, the institute uh, founded by Nick Land is called CCRU. And also in, in early 80s, when it was initially formed, you will find they actually uh, reflect some of the organizations and activities in the UK, like Rave, Acid House, SF Cinema, et cetera. I have put uh, one uh, reference here, if you're interested. Uh, it was published in Guardian uh, very recently, and it succinct, uh, not recently, 2017 actually. But uh, what is relevant here is that we, we see a number of reflections here, and also uh, it captures the history of excellence movement, uh, which I see quite a bit uh, reflection in, in the Freedom Convoy uh, narratives. Uh, and also there's a book uh, written by Robin McKay and Armen Evanesian, you might consult to know more about accelerationist movement. In essence, what this group actually argue that technology, particular computer, AI, and capitalism is most aggressive global variety and should be massively sped up and intensified. They favor further merging of digital and human, which is technically we call now AI, they often favor deregulation of business and drastically scaled back government. And this is the key point. Accelerationists believe in uh, you know, scaling back government. They don't want government rule. They believe that people should stop deluding themselves that economic and technology progress can be controlled. And they also believe that social political upheaval has a value in itself and often through violence. So uh, this is in, uh, in summary, uh, I see that uh, it is happening, uh, you know, uh, the reflections and connections with this group and some of the narratives and uh, you know uh, ideas lectures uh, very much fit into that group uh, but there are certain things uh, i would like to share with you about this whole freedom convoy things today because uh, you you really have to understand from a very bigger perspective for example uh, uh, in in some of the writings what we see that it attracted support of a segment of Canadian population, which doesn't actually identify with the far right, but does feel economically, economically marginalized and hurt by pandemic. And that is important. And one of the uh, large research group is called ECOS from Toronto. Uh, they say that, and they have done actual research on it, uh, and they say that sympathy with the protest and their objective is, is felt by a third of Canadians. And by now means a random third, and it doesn't mean a random third, but by a third defined by clear demographic and attitudinal factors. 
So this is really important. We should focus uh, with regards to this movement. And when I say that, whether it's a one-time anarchy, uh, anarchical event, or it's a is going to be a movement, because this is what this research shows. And we, I also think that uh, the number of groups that we have seen participating in this movement, they evolve. So in terms of intervention, if we think about deplatforming, it don't have much impact because it, this group just disappear and reappear with new name and new membership. And also uh, at, at some point in time, maybe two, three, four years ago, researchers like ours, uh, we observed those groups. We used to just brand them as fringe groups. But this Freedom Convoy shows, and, and, and specifically I have seen posters that the protesters used. They wrote in a large, bold, black format, we are no more fringe. And this is what we also got to be uh, serious that this fringe movement has come out of their fringe periphery. Political participation and solidarity is gradually increasing. Uh, even you know, uh, months ago, uh, just a year ago, we would have dismissed that only you know, PPC, People's Party of Canada and their membership are there. But now we see mainstream political groups are also uh, you know, uh, you know, launching their solidarity uh, behind these groups. Also, we have seen a uh, lot of discussions and uh, you know, chatter that uh, about the law enforcement agencies and whether uh, they acted uh, in a very unbiased manner. For example, uh, people asked uh, if the treatment that these groups received from law enforcement agencies, whether the Black Lives Movement or indigenous protest would have received similar treatment, similar unbiased treatment. So we, we need to also uh, you know, find answer to this question. Also, do not forget that social polarization uh, and protesters uh, among the protesters happen and overwhelmingly white middle class uh, that we see representative in this group. Of course, global solidarity we have seen uh, gained uh, a lot of uh, air from this project. And nevertheless, uh, US was overrepresented in this uh, protest group. Global impact, uh, look at the title, Al Jazeera say, uh, you know, uh, caption, Canada struck a protest, what is going on? And of course, New Zealand had its uh, own movement and the Americans just had, but unfortunately they lost uh, media attention because of Ukraine war. Final one or, or two slides maybe. Uh, let me also uh, summarize that what actually drove the protest. As you see that it may be only economic anxieties uh, driving the protest, uh, but as much as the named issues of vaccine and mask mandates, Remember, those who adamantly opposed to masks and mandates, uh, they are by far the uh, you know, proponent of bleakest economic outlook, outlook and resulting in a generation, generational resentment toward an economy that has seen younger Canadians faring much worse than their parents or grandparents at a similar stage of life cycle. Also to add wage stagnation exacerbated by inflation and affordability is a key force expressing itself in housing and many other sectors. This is taken from ECO's research, which I found uh, quite legitimate. Freedom Convoy does is not a working class movement, but it will be able to harvest and exploit working class anger unless the light of the you know, poorer Canadians, uh, plight of the uh, poorer Canadians improve. So take it as a wake up call. And uh, finally, about intervention, I wrote a, a small piece in the, in the Conversation Canada, as you see, uh, you can always uh, uh, have time to uh, read and uh, read through the piece. What I actually mentioned here is that side-by-side uh, -side law enforcement and court injunctions, we need to also ask a broader question to ourselves, whether we have that uh, society uh, cohesiveness, multicultural, uh, you know, bond that we always, uh, you know, think and say whether it is going to last in the future or not. Because at least this protest convoy showed us that it is composed of over overwhelmingly middle-class white, uh, you know, people and rest are actually non-existing. And this is the, I mean, broader social polarization I see coming out from this convoy. Now it is time to sit together, reflect, 
uh, and also understand how do we you know, address this social polarization exacerbated by COVID economic downturn and, and other anxieties should be handled in the future. So uh, I, I think, I mean, as I said in the beginning, this uh, presentation might be a little tough uh, in terms of you know, various uh, you know, images that I used and also pretty bleak in terms of future because we see it is a, a, as a movement, not a single incident. We are going to have more in the future. So that is why I decided I would like to end the presentation with a little bit of lightheartedness. And also it has some component that I would like to share with you in a, in a lighter way. Uh, so have a listen. Uh, the storyline is two gentlemen stuck in an elevator, which is voice activated. And some of you might have already seen it. Uh, so <laughs> it might be a repeat, but uh, I just wanted to play it here. The, the concept of freedom, how it actually you know, comes to our mind. So that was my main idea of sharing. So I'll, I'll just, I'll not play the whole length. I'll just, uh, you know, briefly uh, stop and pull. So please bear with me. Hauser, it's Jason. Yeah. You, you might want to pause it because it's not coming through with the sound. I think when you share a video, you have to click something to allow the sound to be heard. Oh. I'm not sure on that. Okay. Uh, it's not coming out. Okay. Uh, then we'll just end. Don't bother. I mean, if it uh, the sound is on here, though. Yeah. I think when you okay. share a video, it, it, perhaps because it's embedded, it's just not going not gonna to oh, work. I see. So uh, in that case, uh, 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 let me. So um, uh, I, I just realized that the sound is not coming out. So uh, some of you might be interested to see this small clip, which I wanted to uh, connect uh, to uh, my ideas of freedom today as I was speaking. So uh, the concept of freedom is, uh, as I, as we might agree, that is is quite subjective, contextual, and it depends on the special social group uh, who is subjected to unfreedom. So there are a lot of ways we can express our anxiety about loss of freedom. What I see as an observer researcher in this area uh, for some time in Canada, that this freedom convoy actually uh, is the indication of an anxiety of a particular segment of our society uh, against the establishment, against the social structure, against the democratic governance system. And, and their anxieties must be taken into consideration. And, and the number of uh, overwhelming uh, visual imagery that I used, I showed you today, these also speak about uh, the anxiety and greater problem in our society, uh, which uh, you know the folks, those who use those imageries, they felt that it is legitimate to show these imageries publicly. And four or five years ago, uh, we, we have never imagined that people uh, would be so open and blunt in terms of using hate words publicly, in terms of using homophobic comments, slurs publicly. But in this freedom convoy movement, we have witnessed that too. So this brings me to the, uh, to the conclusion part of today's presentation that uh, as a society now, it is, I think, high time we address those anxieties together. It is not possible to address uh, social conflict issues, which was one of the part of, parts of my PhD research in Winnipeg, uh, where I uh, just imagine that the social conflict issues actually is grounded uh, in, in many ways into our perceptions of justice, freedoms, and all these you know, heavily loaded words. So the concept of justice, freedom, free, freedom from want and fear, these need to be discussed in a more objective way. And this is one of the instances that we have seen freedom convoy protesters have shown us that this is what they think. 
Now, uh, we are not going to judge them whether they are right and wrong today, but we are going to say that uh, we need to address all these concerns in a more cohesive way, in a society where we all live together. And, and the expression of hate is not justified and not appreciated. And this is what I think as an educator uh, uh, in the university and the project that I'm running, uh, if you're interested, uh, is called ERIM, uh, a, a, you know, Extremism and Violence Prevention in Manitoba. We are educating our uh, teachers so that they in turn can educate their students about uh, the symbols, signs, and narratives of extremism so that we all together uh, in a society uh, understand the consequence of violence and hate coming out of these matters. With this, I would like to conclude. And once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Moore Institute, for inviting me. I always take pride in uh, coming out and collaborating with the Moore Institute in, in the pro, uh, research projects uh, that I undertake. So Jason, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kauser. As, as always, uh, extremely well-researched and uh, uh, comprehensive approach to a topic. Uh, reminds me of some of my second year uh, poli-sci professor, Dr. Ferguson here at the university. I always come away with 10 pages of notes out of his class, have to rewrite them all. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways that people could come at this topic and we've got a few minutes in a, in a first question already. And so uh, I'm gonna read that question. It comes from one of our past brown bag lecturers, uh, uh, Professor Gallant over at the Faculty of Law, uh, who compliments your excellent presentation. Question relates exclusively to funding. Uh, what does well-funded conservatives, in quotes, in reference to the funding of the convoy mean? And she's wondering from the point of view of data. So what, what does well-funded conservatives in the, in, in the reference to the funding mean? Thank you, thank you for the question. So uh, the data shows that the conservative group uh, from American side, uh, Republicans, and we have seen uh, a, a series of funding uh, coming out of Republican parties, uh, and these, uh, these have identities. We have seen the numbers, uh, their locations, even uh, surprisingly, uh, some of them even have credit card numbers. So that part from America and from here, here in, within Canada, uh, we have seen uh, parties from Alberta uh, funding this organ I mean, movement quite a bit. And uh, so far I remember uh, it's, it's majority from Alberta, but also we have seen funding coming uh, from uh, the east uh, part of our country, uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, uh, and, and New Brunswick area too. And these fundings uh, are uh, so far the identity wise, what we could track is that uh, they are also uh, mostly, uh, you know, express their opinions uh, uh, in, in terms of conservative uh, political spectrum. Thank you. Thank you, Kauza. She has a, a second question, and then I'll go over to uh, Daniel Tawalef. Uh, we'll have a third question. The second question um, is, is in reference to the parliamentary hearings that took place yesterday. Uh, GoFundMe said 88% uh, of the funding in relation to the account was Canadian, i.e. credit cards and other instruments issued by Canadian-based institutions. So she's wondering if your research suggests otherwise. That, that's what GoFundMe told the hearings yesterday, 88%. Uh, uh, does your funding suggest that, that maybe that's not 100% accurate, recognizing that GoFundMe is Canadian, gives and go is not when you're looking at all the data? So yes, uh, I, I did not mention it because I just saw it yesterday and I didn't have time to verify. And uh, the problem I'm, uh, what I, uh, the data that I use to this presentation is from gives and me uh, platform, not from GoFundMe. And uh, uh, we don't have that, you know, the way that we, access data from the leaked uh, sources uh, from the gives and me uh, you know platform we don't have similar access to go for uh, gofundme page so i didn't have the time to verify and uh, maybe in the future if we ha ca can have some access to these uh, release doc uh, you know uh, statistics from the uh, gofundme page we can have some clear idea but uh, as you have mentioned uh, you are very right uh, so 88% uh, funds uh, those who supported, uh, they gave uh, to go fund me page from Canada. Uh, the one important aspect about both the platforms is that uh, they are online platforms. GoFundMe is well known for years and years. People have raised so many uh, for so many issues, but GoFundMe is actually, as I said, has released one million dollar initially. And then they kind of uh, got into this problem of, uh, you know, because they realized that it is not the exact cause. 
and then they stopped. And also, if I remember correctly, Canadian government uh, issued an injunction so that the GoFundMe uh, uh, cannot release, release further funds. So uh, I totally agree with you that possibly GoFundMe was more uh, with the Canadians than that of Americans. Thank you, Kauser. I'll, I'll invite uh, Daniel Tallaleff to, uh, to join us and ask his question. Oh, OK, sure. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thanks very much uh, for this presentation. Um, the topic's really close to my heart. I, I have a, a close family member, several close family members, and also many, uh, no, a number of very vocal Facebook friends um, who are not vaccinated and who sympathize with this movement, but who are not alt right. And I want to I, I want to just get my two cents in that to the folks I talk to, this is not individual rights and freedoms versus collective rights and freedoms. It's different realities. Uh, and without getting into any more detail, I'll say if I believed what they believe, I don't. But if I did, I wouldn't get vaccinated either. And I might have sympathy for this convoy. And what I want to bring up is that I, you know, I, I started looking into the white nationalist thing. I'm very interested into looking into your research more because it's just it's coded language. It's you have to like it's you. There's a ways of getting in. I started with Pat King because he wears his white supremacism on his sleeve, brought this to my family member. And the response was, oh, yeah, well, OK, that guy's a white nationalist. This one's a white nationalist. That one's a white nationalist. But those are not that's not the movement i believe in who's to say that they're central to the movement cbc well i don't trust cbc um, mainstream media i don't trust mainstream media the real movement opposes vaccine mandates for all this again from their perspective legitimate truth so my question is how oh and and of course always and you're not part of it you're not part of the movement you're not following them on instagram what do you know so my question is for those of us who are not actually in this movement how to sort of tease out the role of white nationalism how to cope with the kind of sh almost shell game of like a movement that means different things to different people which i think is part of its success that's a bit of a rant but can you okay, that there's, no, there's mean, some questions in there <laughs> no no absolutely absolutely and i think you are you are absolutely valid because um, in my current course, which I'm teaching, uh, I, I usually teach uh, in, in the uh, uh, winter session in UFW is called the Special Topics in Geopolitics. Uh, so here uh, I do have a student from uh, our southern part, Steinbach area. And I, we, we chat quite a lot uh, uh, to understand the landscape of resistance, right? And we know Steinbach and uh, that area, uh, many people have not uh, taken the way that we take vaccination seriously and all. So uh, to answer your question in a, in a very superficial way, I beg apology for this. Uh, you know, I don't have, you know, might, might not have very proper uh, answer to your response, but uh, I do see that uh, people from, uh, you know, these groups, they do have very varied you know, ideas about nationalism. And this is what is, I also mentioned in my presentation that I have spoken personally in the protest, uh, some of them, one of my students, uh, he was very forthright and he also uh, spent some time. And we do see incoherent uh, you know, ideas about the protest itself, the objective itself. And, and uh, going back to your question itself that yes, it is the, you know, the tug of war is always between individual rights versus collective rights. And whether as a majority in our society, we are trampling the rights of minority. So that question also comes in. And as I said, we are not judging and I'm not there to judge. And, you know, mainstream media also has some bias. It's totally understandable. And that is why I, I studied Winnipeg alternate media, you know. So the, the, at the end of the day, I would like to say that, yes, uh, uh, you know, the ideas of different versions of nationalism or white nationalism per se is right there in front of our eyes. But the question which bothers me or kind of scares me is the violence embedded in it. So you, we do have different opinions, objectives, and we do have our ideas how to achieve those objectives. But what we see and we have seen in this movement is a lot of talkings about violence lot of discussion about use of violence to achieve those objectives. And here lies my problem and my concern as a researcher. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Daniel, for your, your question. Uh, different ideologies, different realities. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, there's so many different ways to come out of the problem. Uh, we have gone a little bit over time and we're thankful for, for, for Dr. Kauser for taking the extra time and for, for fielding Daniel's question and, and uh, Professor Gallant's. Uh, we thank everyone for joining us today. Dr. Kauser, again, thank you. You mentioned one thing about Crick that I'll just add that you've, you've also been very kind in, in employing some of our students as research assistants and we're very grateful for that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'll just point out to, as we close that next Friday, uh, the MLT Aiken St. Paul's College University Affiliation Lecture featuring Dr. Heather Eden of St. Paul University in Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Eden will be offering her lecture as part of the Symposium for the Common Good, a new initiative of the Jesuit Center for Catholic Studies here at St. Paul's College. And Dr. Eden's lecture is titled Spirituality and Wonder, A Way Forward in Hard Time, focusing on the relationships among the common good, justice, peace, and sustainability, including uh, an awareness of planetary as well as human solidarity. The focus will be on themes of spirituality, ethics, and aesthetics, aesthetics and wonder. So that's next Friday. The link's on our webpage. Dr. Krauser, again, thank you very much for your time today, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you very much. Stay well, stay safe. Bye-bye.